Well, good evening. I am truly humbled to be here. And the turnout is amazing. It says that something good is about to happen. And that the best days are yet ahead. I, my life is truly busy, but when I got an email from Dr. Gibbs that he wanted me to come out, it was not a question of whether or not I was going to come out, the question was when. When could we work it out that I could get here? So my wife and I are truly humbled to be here, and I, I look forward to a wonderful uh, conversation with you. I want to get started and not do a lot of preliminaries, so we have time. Um, for discussion. Um, let me see. Okay, this was the... All right. <laughs> Get into health equity. Um, what I'm going to do, I'm a researcher. I, what I will try to do is to communicate what the science says, and then we can talk about what do we do uh, with it all. So I want to begin by talking about what are the challenges we face in the United States in terms of health. And I'm gonna talk a lot about equity, socioeconomic, racial, place, equity, but I wanna begin with one of the biggest problems we face as a nation. And that is, Americans are not the healthiest people in the world. We should be. We are less than 5% of the world's population According to the World Bank, we consume one half of the money spent on medical care annually is spent in the United States. One half. But we rank near the bottom of the industrialized world on health, and we are losing ground over time. In 1980, we ranked 11th in the world on life expectancy. In 2014, we ranked 35th in the world on life expectancy. Countries like South Korea, Greece, Cyprus, Cuba, and Lebanon have better health than the United States as measured by the length of life. And it's not just the minorities are doing badly. If America, white America were a country, in 2014, it would rank 34th in the world on life expectancy. If black America were a country, it would rank 96th in the world on life expectancy, just illustrating the magnitude of the racial disparities we have, we have in the United States. So while I'm gonna talk about what we need to do in terms of equity in general, we need to begin with a clear recognition that all of us are in trouble and that all Americans are far less healthy than we could or should be. Socioeconomic status is a central determinant of variations in health and a central determinant of the distribution of desirable resources in society. I want to give you an illustration, not as far removed from health as you might think, but think of the SAT tests, right? The scholastic aptitude tests that some are calling the student affluence tests because of the powerful relationship between SAT scores and household economic resources. This is data from the Wall Street Journal. This is 2014 national data on SAT scores in the United States. And you can see this straight line graded relationship that every higher level of household income from incomes less than $20,000 a year to income over $200,000 a year, you see this straight graded relationship between higher household income is associated with higher SAT scores. That raises profound questions of what does the SAT score means and how even as a society we should use it. But we can come back to that. There are large socioeconomic inequities in health. In fact, in the United States and around the world, in virtually every country in the world where we have data, Tell me something about one's socioeconomic status, their income, education, occupational status, and wealth, and I can tell you something about health. Here is one example from a study I was involved with several years ago. This is um, national data for the United States, um, looking at the risk of all-cause mortality 
comparing to Americans with $115,000 or more, and you can see the lowest income Americans have a death rate that is three times higher than those of the highest income Americans. But what you also see is not a threshold effect, but a graded effect, that every higher level of household income is associated with a lower um, risk of overall mortality. Those data on socioeconomic status and its powerful relationship to health would predict that there'd be large racial ethnic differences in health. Why? Because there are large racial ethnic differences in socioeconomic status in the US. Let me give you some national data for the United States from the US Census Bureau. This is household income in the US in 2015. And I'm just putting it in a way that you can't possibly miss the point. So I'm standardizing on the household income of whites. And I'm giving whites $1 of household income. And I'm saying, how do other racial groups compare in their household income for every dollar of income that white households have? And so for every dollar of income that white households have in the United States, national data for the US, Asian households have $1.23. That has to be contextualized by the fact that 70% of Asians are immigrants and Asians have markedly the highest level of education in the United States. And Asians also have, of any racial group, more persons contributing to household income than any other group. So if I did a per person measure of income, whites would have the highest per person measure of income. But let's look at the uh, historically disadvantaged groups. For every dollar of household income in 2015 that white households have, Latinos have 72 cents, Native Americans have 62 cents, and African Americans have 59 cents. What is stunning about the 59 cents figure is that is identical to the racial gap in income in 1978. I didn't mis make a mistake. I didn't get the years confused. In 1978, the peak year of the narrowing of the income gap from the 1960s as a result of the civil rights policies and the anti-poverty policies, the gap was closed to 59 cents for African Americans to the income of whites. And that's exactly where we were in 2015. Most of my students think we have made a lot more progress than that in the United States. And as bad as the income data should look, they dramatically understate the racial differences in economic resources. Why? Because income only captures the flow of resources into the household. It tells us nothing about the economic reserves that households have to cushion shortfalls of income. We get that by looking at wealth. And wealth captures the savings, the economic reserves, the home equity, the, the, the second home, the added assets that individuals have. And the latest uh, federal data on wealth in the United States shows that for every dollar of wealth whites have, blacks have six pennies and Latinos have seven pennies. The racial gap in wealth is wider today than it was when President Obama took office because as a result of the housing crisis, blacks and Latinos had disproportionate losses in home ownership and home equity and a widening of the racial gap in wealth. So, not surprisingly, there are large racial ethnic differences in health. And I wanna make this concrete for you. One of the ways that scholars have studied this is by coming up with this concept called excess deaths. And excess deaths refers to how many people of one racial group, so in this case, let's say black people, die each year who wouldn't die if there were no racial differences in health. And the latest report on excess deaths in the United States says that 83,000 black people die each year who wouldn't die if there weren't racial disparities in health. If I divide that by 365, I get over 220 black people dying prematurely every single day. Imagine a fully loaded jumbo jet with 220 passengers and crew 
taken off from Portland's airport and crash in tomorrow. And the same thing happened every day this week and every day next week and every day next month and every day for a year. 220 Americans dying prematurely every day. That's what we mean, and that's just for blacks, when I say there are racial disparities in health in the United States. And these disparities in health start early, and even though we've made progress over time, they are strikingly persistent. This is one example. This is infant mortality rates by race in the United States. Infant mortality refers to the chances of a baby dying before its first birthday. And what these data show, that African Americans and Native Americans have markedly elevated risk of infant deaths, dying before their first birthday, and the infant mortality rate for African Americans is more than twice that uh, of whites in the United States. We've made progress over time. Here's national data for the United States and another widely used indicator of health, life expectancy. Life expectancy at birth is how long would the average person live. And the good news is, if you look at 1950 to the present, you can see life expectancy has continually steadily increased for whites and it has steadily increased for African Americans, the two groups for which we have data going back to 1950. That's good news. There's also more good news. In 1950, there was an eight-year gap in life expectancy. In 2010, whites live on average four years longer than African Americans, so we have reduced the racial gap in, infant, in life expectancy by half. That is progress and needs to be celebrated. At the same time, a four-year gap in life expectancy is quite large. If we froze the life expectancy of whites and had a life expectancy of African Americans increase at the average rate at which life expectancy has increased in the last 20 years, it will take 30 years to close that four-year gap. In fact, look at the data. The life expectancy of whites in 1950 was 69.1 years. The average white person lived at birth, 69.1 years. And let's ask, how long did it take before African Americans equaled the overall health as captured by life expectancy that whites had in 1950? 1990, 40 years later, there's a 30 to 40 year gap in all of these comparisons between two groups living within the same society. When my career started, most scientists believed that these racial differences in health were simply a function of racial differences in socioeconomic status, in income, education, occupational status. We now know that life is more complicated. And I want to illustrate that again with national data for the United States, looking at life expectancy at age 25. So at age 25, we talked about life expectancy at birth, we can calculate it at any age. So at age 25, how long will the average white person live? How long will the average black person live? The average white person will live five years longer than the average African American, a five-year gap in health. However, this is the power of socioeconomic status now. When we look within the white population, by years of education, on average, whites with a college degree or more education will live 6.4 years longer than whites who are high school dropouts. So the gap within race is bigger, 6.4, than the black-white gap. And if we look within African Americans, college-educated African Americans will live 5.3 years longer than African Americans who've dropped out of high school. Again, the gap within African Americans is bigger than the black-white gap. At the same time, at every level of education, by the way, the same is true for income. In the interest of time, I'm only going to show you the education data. At every level of education, race matters. So white high school dropouts live 3.1 years longer than black high school dropouts. And one of the most stunning statistics I'm going to show you now is this one. And that is whites with a college degree or more education live 4.2 years longer than African Americans with a college degree or more education. And if you look at the data carefully, 
Whites with a college degree or more education live longer than African Americans with a college degree or more education. Whites with some college live longer than African Americans with a college degree or more education. And whites who have completed high school live longer than African Americans with a college degree or more education. This is national data for the United States, not a sample. What does this say? This says that there are profound forces linked to socioeconomic status that drive health. But there's something else about race that matters profoundly even after you've taken income or education into account. And so one of the things that I have focused on in the last 25 years is trying to understand what else is it about race? And could it be that racism is a critical missing piece of the puzzle that is a driver of inequalities in health? And so I want to talk about the house that racism built. And I think of racism as primarily a system. Now, listen to me. I didn't say it's individual beliefs and behavior. I didn't say it was prejudice. Racism is primarily a system, an organized system, premised on an ideology of inferiority, that some groups are better than others. And this system has given rise to differential behavior at a level of individuals, but most profoundly at a level of social institutions. And it has generated beliefs and values that are consistent with some groups being superior to others. And these beliefs and values are deeply embedded in the culture, and they interact with other societal institutions to shape outcomes in American society. I will break that down for you very slowly. So let us think about the discrimination, I said at the individual level and institutional level. It's important to think of both. So let me illustrate individual discrimination by looking at some research from researchers at Portland State University. They asked a very simple question. When people stand at a crosswalk intending to cross the street, does your race determine how long it takes for motorists to stop to allow you to cross the street? And so they took three black males and three white males, dressed them similarly, and put them at different intersections and demonstrating the same approach that they were intending to cross the street and wanted to see if race mattered. And they found that multiple cars were twice as likely to pass a black pedestrian waiting to cross the street. And on average, African Americans had to wait 32% longer to cross the street than whites did in the great city of Portland. That's an example of individual discrimination. It illustrates what individual drivers did. I want us to think about institutional discrimination, and I picked an example also linked to waiting. This is national data for the United States, the 2012 presidential election. How long did people have to wait to vote in the presidential election? And you could see African Americans waited 23 minutes on average to vote across the United States, almost twice as long as whites waited to vote. None of that reflected the individual behavior of local precinct workers. Instead, it represented forces linked to where you voted and the administrative procedures and budgeting and policies that determine how much space was allocated to particular places, how much staff was hired at particular precincts, it did not reflect the local, individual behavior of precinct workers. But the result was the same. And that is that, on average, certain racial groups waited longer in order to vote because of institutional discrimination built into policies that operate even if the people administering them have no animosity in their heart. I want to share with you one of the deepest secrets 
in policy circles in American society. One compelling example of institutional discrimination that is shaping policies profoundly in the United States, including policies linked to health and socioeconomic status, and that is residential segregation. Residential segregation is a striking legacy of racism, as is the forced removal and relocation of indigenous peoples that locates particular people in particular places. John Sell, a historian at Duke University, wrote a book about the origins of segregation in the US South and South Africa. John Sell actually shows that the framers of apartheid in South Africa in the early 20th century looked across the Atlantic and saw what Americans had done since the slaves had been freed and the development of segregation in the late 19th, early 20th century, and they said, brilliant. We will implement that in South Africa, and we will tweak it. Importantly, John Sill argued that residential segregation by race, which no one is talking about, is one of the most successful domestic policies of the 20th century in the United States because it's beneath the radar screen, but it is shaping outcomes in profound ways. Let me show you some recent social science research about how segregation shapes outcomes because you're saying, what does your address have to do with anything? Well, where you live determines where you go to school for on average in the US. It determines the quality of education you have access to. It determines your access to job opportunities, to the quality of housing, the quality of neighborhood environments, uh, the, the access to, to, to fresh, nutritious food, the access to safe places to exercise, the exposure to, to toxic substances, uh, access to high quality medical care, the quality of city services that you receive, all of that is driven by place. This is a, a map. Um, Steve Wolf has created these maps. This is one for Denver, Colorado, but he's created them for many cities. And within the city of Denver, just by looking at people in one neighborhood compared to another, there's much as an 11-year difference in life expectancy. In some US cities, there's a 20-year difference in life expectancy, just linked to which neighborhood you live in. Place matters a lot for health. And in public health, researchers now say that your zip code is a stronger predictor of how long and how well you live than your genetic code. But let's look at empirical evidence. Two of the country's most eminent sociologists, William Julius Wilson and Robert Sampson, studied 171 largest cities in the United States and said because of segregation, there's not even one city where whites live under equal conditions to blacks and that the worst urban context in which whites reside is considerably better than the average context of black communities. How powerful is segregation? It contributes. It's responsible for the large racial differences in income and education that we talked about. Let me draw on work here of David Cutler, uh, until recently the dean of the social sciences at Harvard University, one of the country's leading economists using fancy econometric models I cannot fully describe. He is able to statistically estimate, using high quality statistical procedures, what would happen in America, studying a national sample of blacks and whites, if we could only eliminate residential segregation. And he documents if we could eliminate residential segregation, we would completely erase black-white differences in income, in education and in unemployment and reduce black-white differences in single motherhoods by two-thirds. All of that driven by the opportunities linked to place and where people live in the United States. What does that mean? It means that the racial ethnic differences in income and education that we see are not random events. They didn't just happen, they're not acts of God they reflect the successful implementation of social policy. Social policy doing what they were exactly intended to do, and it reflects the extent to which institutional discrimination has produced a truly rigged system in the United States. 
So I've talked about one institutional mechanism of racism, segregation, which shapes a broad range of outcomes in profound ways. I want to talk a little bit about individual discrimination. Now, I started to talk about that because I showed you an example of individual discrimination in waiting to cross the street. There is similar high-quality scientific evidence that comes from, from what I call audit studies, where you hold everything identical, and the only thing you vary is race, that documents discrimination in a broad range of domains of life, from hailing a taxi to renting an apartment to getting a loan to getting insurance to buying a home. All of these are areas where high-quality scientific evidence documents the persistence of discrimination in American society. I have been particularly interested in the extent to which at least some of the experiences of discrimination individuals are aware of and that they can be a source of stressful life experiences that individuals have and then what's the impact of that kind of stress on health. And so I developed um, a number of measures to capture discrimination one that has really taken off is the everyday discrimination scale because of how powerful a predictor of health it is. It doesn't capture all aspects of discrimination. It just captures the minor indignities, the day-to-day -day little things in which you are reminded that you are less than. You are treated with less courtesy than others and treated with less respect and receive poorer service than, at, than others at restaurants or stores. And people act as if they think you are not smart or if they are afraid of you or if they think you are dishonest. Just, just nine items that capture that. Just to illustrate the power of that, I'm showcasing the work of Dr. Tenny Lewis, who um, was a faculty at Yale University when she did this study. Each line on this slide represents a different published peer-reviewed paper. In one study, in, in all of the studies, she's looking at the exposure is everyday discrimination and a broad range of health outcomes, statistically adjusting for all kinds of confounders, for those who are interested in the methods here. But higher levels of everyday discrimination predicts more rapid uh, development of coronary calcification for people followed over five years, predicts higher levels of inflammation, predicts higher levels of blood pressure. Pregnant women who report everyday discrimination give birth to lower birth weight infants. A study of the elderly followed over time, higher levels of everyday discrimination predicts more rapid declines in cognitive function over time. A community sample, higher levels of everyday discrimination predicts poorer sleep. A study of adults followed over time, everyday discrimination is an independent predictor of premature mortality. It literally is killing people. A study of African American and white women looking at the relationship between everyday discrimination and abdominal fat, everyday discrimination was not related um, to subcutaneous fat, that's the, the fat just immediately under your skin. Um, but it was a powerful predictor of visceral fat, the deep fat in between your internal organs, which is the bad kind of fat that l increases your risk for cardiovascular disease and, and other conditions. So just this slide illustrates the power of the research now documenting everyday discrimination as a bona fide risk factor for disease. Let me give you one other study. There, there, there are literally hundreds of studies. In the early days of work in this era, I could keep up. In fact, I reviewed all the papers. They, I, I'm just overwhelmed. There's just so much work from around the world documenting that video discrimination. But I want to focus on the work of Gene Brody in, in Atlanta. Because he has been studying discrimination in a sample of African-American adolescents. And what he finds, that African-American youth who score high on everyday discrimination at age 16, 17, and 18. So they are teenagers. By age 20, I didn't say age 40, I said by age 20, they have higher levels of stress hormones, cortisol, epinephrine, norepinephrine, higher levels of blood pressure, higher levels of inflammation, higher levels of weight. So the effects of discrimination on health is evident very early in life, by age 20, among these African-American adolescents. So I've talked about racism affecting institutional processes through segregation. I've talked about the stress of discrimination 
I want to talk finally about racism within the culture and how it has consequences for health. Where do these negative stereotypes come from and what, what consequences um, do they have for health? You know, scholars, some of us, are ingenious. A group of scholars have produced a database of American culture. They've put in this database of 10 million words, the books, magazine articles, and so on, that the average college-educated American would read over their lifetime. What is brilliant about this is if you've put American culture into a database, you can now look within that culture and say, when the word black appears in American culture, what adjective is most frequently used with black? The answer is poor, and then violent, and then religious, and then lazy, then cheerful, then dangerous. For comparison, by the way, these are measures of associative strength. They're not the same, but think of them as simple correlation coefficients. They function the same way. If they, they always were tied together, it would be one. And the higher the, the score, it means the more tightly those things are, are, are paired together. When white appears, wealthy, progressive, conventional, stubborn, successful, educated. For the fun of it, when female appears, distant, warm, gentle, passive, male, dominant, leader, logical, strong. Sounds familiar, right? Deeply embedded stereotypes in American culture. Here are the 10 most common words used tied with black and white. And I've highlighted the, the negative stereotypes. And you see there are some negative stereotypes for whites, but they're not as strong, they're strength, they're not as closely tied together. And folks, this has profound implications for what we're studying as a society and what we're facing. Because you see the prominence of violent, lazy, and dangerous as negative stereotypes for blacks, as what, what, what people growing up in American society have seen paired together. This means that when a cop views an African-American male as more violent and dangerous than he actually is and overreacts, we are not necessarily dealing with a bad cop. We may be simply viewing a normal American, reflecting what is deeply embedded in his subconscious as a result of being raised in this society. Because there's a lot of scientific research that documents that these negative stereotypes trigger racial discrimination. One example of this was a 2003 report from the Institute of Medicine entitled Unequal Treatment. The committee, I served on the committee, was commissioned by United States Congress in 1999, that Congress asked the Institute of Medicine, now called the National Academy of Medicine, to answer a simple question. When black people and other minorities enter healthcare context in the United States, does your race determine what's the quality of medical care you will receive? We were not to address questions of access. Yes, there are racial differences in access. Given access, does your race matter. And what we found that it did. At the time, there were more than, there were almost 200 published peer-reviewed papers and over 80% of them documented that African Americans and other minorities receive poorer quality care and less intensive care across virtually every medical procedure from the most simple to the most complicated. To make this real, let me just give you an example of two studies by the same researcher. Dr. Knox Todd was an emergency room physician at UCLA Medical Center. And he asked a simple question. When a patient comes into the UCLA emergency department with a long bone fracture, does medical speak for a broken bone in the arm or legs? Does your ethnicity determine whether you get pain medication? You get a picture? And he found that 55% of Hispanics who had been treated at UCLA for a long bone fracture in the prior year had received no pain medication compared to 26% of non-Hispanic whites. Dr. Todd was a good researcher, he said confounding. So statistically he adjusted for 
whether the patient spoke English or not, whether they got injured on the job or not, what time they showed up in the ER, how long they spent in the ER, what, how severe was the fracture, were they, were they uh, hospitalized. After statistically adjusting for every other plausible explanatory factor, he found that the single biggest predictor of whether a patient got pain medication or not with a broken bone in the arm or leg was whether you were Hispanic or not. And that Hispanics, statistically adjusting for everything else, was seven and a half times less likely to get pain medication compared to whites. Dr. Todd moved from UCLA to Emory University in Atlanta, repeated the same study at three large emergency rooms in Atlanta, looking at black and white patients and found exactly the same thing. A black person with a broken bone in the arm or legs goes into the emergency room, is less likely to get pain medication compared to a white patient. Now don't focus on pain because this has been documented in every area of medicine. There were more studies in the area of cardiovascular disease than any other area. How on earth do we make sense of this? How is it possible that in a country with the best trained workforce, where most providers, the overwhelming majority, wake up every day to do their best for all of their patients, can nonetheless produce a pattern of care that appears to be so discriminatory? The Institute of Medicine report concluded that the most plausible explanation for this phenomenon was something that social psychologists had studied for more than three decades call unconscious discrimination, implicit bias, unthinking discrimination, because what that research shows, and this is important, it's not about white people, it's not about healthcare providers, it's not about Americans, it's about human beings. It's about how all of us process information. And we process information, the complex cognitive information we're bombarded with, by putting things into categories. Social categorization is normal. That's how we all do it. What matters, though, is if deeply embedded in our minds, based on our socialization, we associate negative attributes with a particular category. The research shows in one third of the time it takes to blink your eye, you make a judgment about that person and will treat them differently. That is, you will discriminate against them. Without your conscious awareness, without any intention on your part. I tell my students that I am a prejudiced person. Why? Because I like to think of myself as a normal human being. And if you are a normal human being, you are most likely prejudiced. I didn't say you are racially prejudiced, because this is not just about race. Every society, every culture, Every community has in-groups and out-groups. If you have negative stereotypes about gay people, if you have negative stereotypes about fat people, about old people, about women, these processes occur. It's a normal human process. And the person who says, I would never do this, that's not me, you are perfectly set up to do it. It's the person who recognizes that could be me. Can deal with addressing it. I'd like to point to the divine solution. Professor Patricia Devine from the University of Wisconsin at Madison has put together a number of strategies that have been shown in individual psychological studies to reduce implicit biases from occurring, and she's shown that they can work to reduce implicit biases for individuals and that the effect is sustained for months later. I'll just give you one example of the strategies is individuation. Our normal mechanisms of processing information is social categorization. We put things into categories. Research in the United States finds that when we meet somebody, and again, one third of the time it takes a blink of eye, we notice their race, their age, their gender, and we make judgments about them, of whether they're trustworthy or not. We put things into categories. Individuation says, when I meet someone, I will take time to focus on the individual characteristics of this individual and not of the social categories to which they belong. It takes time, it takes awareness. If we're working on the time pressure, 
we tend not to do it. We tend to go into a default social categorization um, basis, but it's just an example of what we can do. There's also research talking about cultural racism that documents there's also internalized racism. Some members of uh, uh, non-dominant groups, stigmatized groups, believe as true the negative societal stereotype of their group. And that also adversely impacts their health. In the interest of time, I'm going to move on. So what I've talked about is the multiple mechanisms by which racism shapes access to income, education, unemployment status, health, and so on. We need to think of the resources that people bring together to fight against racism. But all of these inequalities then reinforce the stereotypes because blacks are doing more poorly in education. Of course, they were intellectually inferior. And then the reinforcement of the stereotype goes right back to strengthen the system of racism in the first place the house that racism built. So what can we do? What can we do about all these problems that I have talked about? The first thing I think we need to do, and I'm speaking to this moment in American political history, is we need to keep the safety net in place. Because if we weaken the safety net, as there are proposals in Washington, D.C. to do, we will only make things a lot worse. We don't have to guess about this. We just need to go down through uh, memory lane. Back in 1981, the administration of Ronald Reagan passed the Omnibus Reconciliation Act in 1981. What did that act do? 500,000 persons lost welfare. One million people were dropped from food stamps. 600,000 people lost Medicaid in the United States. 250 federally funded centers closed. Uh, health centers closed in the United States. One million children lost reduced price school meal. And the WIC program had enough funding to only serve a third of the people that were eligible. That's what happened uh, right after 1981 when the social safety net was weakened in the United States. What were the consequences for health? Um, we saw a nationwide increase in women, pregnant women who did not receive prenatal care. We saw a 143% increase in anemia in pregnant women. We saw an increase in low birth weight across the United States. We saw an increase in infant mortality for poor populations in 20 states. We saw people showing up, children, in Minneapolis and Chicago in studies in Boston with preventable childhood diseases. We saw an increase in blood lead levels in children. We saw an increase in chronic disease in adults. So what I'm saying is the safety net was cut, and within a year or two, there were pervasive negative effects on the most vulnerable populations in the United States. What else do we need to do? So I'm saying we need to mobilize as citizens to keep the safety net in place. Secondly, we need care that addresses the social context. The World Health Organization Commission on the Social Determinants of Health asks, what do we accomplish if all we do is treat illness and send people back to live in the same conditions that made them sick in the first place? It means that we need to ask new questions of how can we identify patients' non-medical health needs, because when we address the non-medical health needs, we help them to take care of their health. How can we connect our patients with local services and resources that will help them? How can we, the healthcare sector, collaborate with other sectors to improve health where people live, learn, work, play, and worship? How can we connect community residents to jobs given in many communities the healthcare sector is the largest employer? How can we use lay health workers and community health workers to improve the health of individuals and provide the needed support that they have? Uh, there are many examples of this. One that I like particularly um, is the Medical Legal Partnership. Dr. Zuckerman, um, some 30 years ago at the Boston Medical Center, head of pediatrics, implemented this program. So at the Boston Medical Center, a primary care provider in the Department of Pediatrics can refer a patient to a number of specialists. One of the specialists he or she can refer to is a lawyer. The hospital has on-site attorneys to solve problems in the lives of their patients. You see, if a mother brings a child to the pediatrics unit, 
and that child has asthma that is secondary to living in a moldy apartment, and the mother has complained repeatedly to the landlord, and nothing has happened, all the asthma medication in the world will not help that child to breathe symptom-free if the child is going back to the same conditions that made that child sick in the first place. And yes, a lawyer that calls the landlord and says you are in violation of the housing code of the state of Massachusetts and we will sue you if you don't fix the problem does produce results. So a medical legal partnership is one strategy but there are others. Health Leads is another one that uses undergraduate volunteers to do similar things. Um, here is a classic study done by Len Syme, published in 1978. Len Syme at Berkeley, 244 low-income patients, 80% of them African-American, randomly assigned to receive one-third routine care, sent on their merry way. Second, routine care plus a health education intervention, a lecture once a week for 12 weeks. Or third, they trained lay workers from the local community in the basics about hypertension and also trained them in what were the resources that existed in the community, didn't have a revolution, didn't create new resources, but trained local people in the resources that existed to help people with problems that they face. And they sent those lay health workers to make home visits. Seven months later, they found that patients in the outreach group had contact with the lay health workers, were more likely to have their blood pressure controlled, knew more about their blood pressure than any other group, were more compliant in taking their blood pressure medications, and among good compliers, they were was twice as successful at controlling their blood pressure. Why? Because for those in the lay community intervention group, their health problem was understood and addressed, not as an organ system that was sick, but within the context of their lives. And so you had everything that a provider wanted. But we need to move further upstream. We need to address the non-medical determinants of health. Given the role of segregation, we need to have some place-based solutions in place. What are some of the things we need to do? One, we need to start early. Uh, let me give you an example of a program that started early and has had dramatic results. The Abyssadarian Project in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, took economically disadvantaged, mainly African-American children, randomized them at birth to an early childhood um, program in which they receive a nurturing and safe environment, good nutrition, pediatric care, stimulating environment from birth through five, they have now been followed over time. And this is, again, a randomized controlled trial. You've got a control group and you've got an intervention group. At age 21, the intervention group, fewer symptoms of depression, less, lower marijuana use, more active lifestyle, um, better educational and vocational asset benefits. By their mid-30s, they have now looked at their risk factors for cardiovascular disease and they find that the intervention group is doing better on multiple dimensions. I'll give you one example. Look at the systolic blood pressure differences. 143 among the control group, the intervention group 126. Dramatic differences on a broad range of cardiometabolic risk factors linked to what we did birth through five. Starting early makes a difference. We also need to improve economic well-being. In the last 60 years, the biggest narrowing of the black-white gap in health occurred when the black-white gap in income narrowed, and that was between 1968 and 1978. Rich, there have been several studies, but I'll just give you one of them. Richard Cooper shows that the declines in mortality for men and for women, this is the percentage decline for men, this is the declines for women and the percentage decline for women, it was larger for African Americans than for whites. The health of African Americans between 1968 and 1978 improved more rapidly than the health of whites, and we had a narrowing of the black-white gap. What happened since 1978? You see the 59 cents figure I mentioned earlier. Throughout the decade of the 90s, 
the era of Reaganomics, of the 80s, sorry, the era of Reaganomics, you can see the income of African Americans fell below the 1978 um, level. It was not until 1992 that African Americans got back up to where they had been in 1978. What happened to the health of African Americans during that time? For four years in a row, after 1984, so there seems to be a lag time involved, for four years in a row, the life expectancy of African Americans declined from the 1984 level. During the 1980s, the era of trickle-down economics, we had an absolute worsening of the health of African Americans. What else do we need to do? Improving neighborhood and housing conditions. We have examples from randomized control trial, the move into opportunity um, study, where public housing uh, residents were randomized to move to better housing, lower uh, housing with lower levels of poverty. They have been looked at 10 to 15 years later. Those who were randomized to live in better neighborhoods lower rates of obesity, lower rates of severe obesity, lower diabetes risk. No health intervention. All that was done, they changed their neighborhood. Now, I think this provides high quality scientific evidence. I don't think it provides a model. You shouldn't have to move out of your neighborhood to live in a better neighborhood. But we need to invest in the neighborhood to improve the quality of life, and we know if we do that, we will improve outcomes. We also need to dismantle institutional racism, and that is not easy. Why? Because I said that racism is an organized system. And one of the things about a system is that racism shapes all of these dimensions of society. And um, Barbara Reskin, a sociologist, points out that all of these dimensions of society, they're all of these subsystems that reinforce each other. And if you only attack one, others compensate to maintain the status quo. But it's possible to make a difference, but we need to have a comprehensive approach. And I want to share with you one exciting comprehensive approach. It's purpose-built communities. It's a movement across the United States, starting in East Lake, Atlanta, that is trying to address all of the social ills that disadvantaged communities face simultaneously. Let me give you an example of the transformation that has taken place in East Lake Meadows, Atlanta. Back in 1995, this was a African-American public housing project where 90% of the residents were victims of a felony every year, which operated a $35 million a year drug trade from this public housing project. Um, many of the units in this public housing project were unlivable. Only 13% of adults were gainfully employed. Um, the school was one of the worst performing in the state of Georgia. I visited this place, the same place, uh, two years ago. If you vi visit the villages of East Lake today, this is what you see. There's been a 73% reduction in crime, a 90% reduction in violent crime. It's mixed income. 50% of the residents still qualify for public housing. Um, all able-bodied persons are employed. The school is one of the best performing schools in the entire state of Georgia. A complete transformation of a community. There's a, a supermarket right next door to the housing project. It's amazing the transformation that has been done as the community leaders worked with a wealthy philanthropist and worked with um, the city of Atlanta and have completely transformed that neighborhood. This model is being replicated in communities across the United States and purpose-built communities will provide free technical assistance to any community in America who wants to replicate their model. Why it's important is that it shows that it can be done. Because too often, I run into people, the school that's doing so well, 60% of the students still qualify for reduced price lunches. Yet it is one of the best performing in the entire state of Georgia. It's possible, it can be done if we put our minds to it. One last example and then I'm gonna stop. As we think of undoing racism, it is not enough 
to open the doors of opportunity. We need to ensure that those persons for whom we've opened the doors are able to walk through them. Let me give you, illustrate that with the case of medicine in the United States. And help me to answer the question, how well did affirmative action in medicine work for women and minorities? Most people, most Americans, when they hear of affirmative action, they think of minorities and forget that affirmative action was for women and minorities. And forget that affirmative action has been very successful for women, and most of the women have been white, and have gone home to white households. So the biggest beneficiary of, Amer of affirmative action in America have been whites. And whites show the greatest opposition to affirmative action. Immense irony. But let's look at data. This is 1965. You can see only 6.9% of medical graduates in America were female as a result of affirmative action policies in the 60s and 70s. In 2010, 48%. Today, it's 50%. Dramatic improvement. Here are the numbers for minorities. And I go back to 1950. You could see in 19... Um, 60 and 1970, just about three point something percent of all medical school graduates were African American. And you could see in 2010, just over 6% of medical school graduates are African American Latino. For Native Americans, they're still hovering less than 1%. So what I'm saying is affirmative action policies work much better for women than they did for minorities. Why? I think the different success reflect that the women were prepared to walk through the doors of opportunity. The minorities were not. It's not enough to bring people to the starting line of a race and say, because I've put you at the start of the race, you are free to run and to compete when you are still shackled. And we have to think of what we do to the pipeline and how we build the pipeline, and how we prepare individuals to be successful, because it's not enough simply to open the doors. In 2014, according to WAMC, there were 27 fewer African-American males in the first year of medical school in the United States than there had been in 1978. In the mid-1960s, 2.9% of all practicing physicians in the US were black. In 2012, only 3.8% of all practicing physicians in the US were black. The numerator and denominator has increased, um, but it's, we've gone from 2.9% to 3.8%, 5.2% were Latino. There is nothing so unfair, Thomas Jefferson said, as the equal treatment of unequal people. There is enormous inequality I have described tonight and there is nothing so unfair if, as some Americans would like to insist, that we treat everybody the same. You cannot treat everyone the same if they're not starting out at the same place. So what am I saying tonight? Racism in its multiple forms is alive and well. Its most powerful effects are through policies and procedures that are deeply embedded in social institutions. We need to acknowledge and understand its manifestations. We need redouble efforts to mitigate its negative effects. Most importantly, we need to create the political will and support to dismantle the social structures that support racism, ethnocentrism, anti-immigrant sentiments, and incivility. And I leave you with two quotations from two of my favorite people. Dr. Martin Luther King said, true compassion is more than flinging a coin to a beggar. It understands that an edifice which produces beggars needs restructuring. And then Robert F. Kennedy said, each time a man or woman stands up for an ideal, or acts to improve the lot of others, or strikes out against injustice, he or she sends forth a tiny ripple of hope. And those ripples can build a current which can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. Your presence here tonight testifies to the fact that you would like to be a ripple of hope. And I encourage you to keep that flame alive in your heart and to go forth from this place and work together to build a healthier Portland and a healthier Oregon. Thank you.